Okay, well, uh, good morning everybody. You will not believe this, but it took me forever to figure out the way in which I could record both the images and, um, and the sounds in this presentation. Today I want to talk about earthquakes and faults. Or is it faults and earthquakes? Well, that's one of the things that we're going to have to explore in this lecture. So, an earthquake. What is an earthquake? Well, an earthquake is when everybody panics and, and things start falling and, and you freak out and God knows what an earthquake is. Um, the Greeks were probably the first ones to wonder about earthquakes. There's lots of earthquakes in, in Greece. And Aristotle, that uh, very clever man, figured that he could intuit the reason for things just by thinking about it. So he, in a very clever pronouncement, he said that what happened is that during earthquakes or eruptions were symbols that the earth was sick. And, and for a long time, that's what everybody said, that the gases moving through the rumbling belly of the earth was what was causing the, the earthquakes. And somewhere along the line, somebody figured out that it was the rumbling of those gases that caused waves in the earth so imagine that the earth is all sick and passes gas under the blanket and the blanket ripples and that was what caused the earthquakes because indeed an earthquake is nothing else but the passage of an elastic wave past a given point in in space um now one thing that we knew early somebody found early on this is uh, a photograph taken in in california and um, that very frequently new faults were recognized or, or faults were recognized uh, when earthquakes had taken place and you can see that one of the problems that we have of building faults uh, buildings in fault lines is that they may get damaged but there was a big question was it the earthquake that was causing the ground to break or was it the breaking that was causing the earthquake to to form now for the longest time it was thought that it was the earthquake that caused the faults the ground to break and it was somewhere in the late 1800s that a japanese geologist whose name i don't remember uh, for the first time posed the question well what if it is the fault and it is as the fault breaks that the earthquake is generated. He didn't have any any proof or any reason to think that way. He was just being contrarian. And uh, it really had to wait until the 1906 San Francisco earthquake uh, for the data to be generated. And that is kind of an interesting story on the way uh, science works. See, shortly after the United States took over California, the U.S. Coast Survey started mapping the the San Francisco Peninsula and they started like in 1853 or something like that, pretty early in the game. Uh, but by 1869 they were able to publish a full beautiful map with contour lines and you cannot see that in here but this is indeed a, a beautiful map of the San Francisco Peninsula. Now, um, this was basically using all data, data that had been acquired during the first few years. And then the, the miners started coming and the gold was discovered in California. There was a rush. A lot of new merchants uh, located themselves in the city and there were ships coming and going. So by the time 1882 rolled in, the city had changed considerably. And you can see in this map in purple are those areas that had been filled uh, on top of the original uh, configuration of the of the peninsula and in fact those areas are the ones that are most susceptible to liquefaction because mostly they were filled with dirt and um, not compacted just dumped into the ocean but anyway that's not why I pointed out this photograph the one interesting thing that was noticed in this map is that the distance between those two points, these two points here, in the 1869 and the 1882 map, this is like Merced, was identical, you know, to the inch, which is not surprising. I mean, these were some of the finest surveyors of the 
uh, of the army of the navy sorry but the odd thing is that the distance between this point and this point in both maps was off and the same is true for the distance between this point and this point which were off by a couple of feet you know way more than than the surveyors of that time would consider acceptable and that was uh, that was a big puzzle and then in 1906 the earthquake happened the whole peninsula was shaken and uh, and congress uh, appointed uh, reed it forget what his first name was a geologist and they said okay you go back to California and figure out a, a way for this thing never to happen again and here's all the money that that you may need so he did some fantastic work geologic work but another thing that he did is he commissioned another survey of the city and much to his surprise he found that the distance between those two points in the 1869 map and the new map, the post-1906 map, was actually the same, within a, an inch. However, the distance between those two points along Lake Merced had changed considerably. And it had changed considerably for obvious reasons. There had been movement along a fault, and you could see many, many features, like this fence that has been in, displaced. In, so it was clear that here was a difference of five, six feet that accounted for the difference between those two points. But why had these two points, which were different in 1883, had now come back to what it had been in 1869? And it was based on that that Reed proposed uh, the theory of formation of earthquakes by elastic rebound. So imagine that you have a block and there's a fault the fault runs from here to here is not the red not the red line the red line is a line of surf bay and stresses started accumulating on that fault so that the rocks on both sides of the fault were bent well that would change the, the distance between say this point and this point or this point and this point but not the distance between two points that straddled that boundary. Enter an earthquake and then there was displacement from the fault and now you would see the considerable difference here in between the, the two points along the zone of break but these two points would go back to what they had originally. And basically what he concluded is that as a fault was being loaded, so to speak, or stress started accumulating, there was elastic deformation in the materials, and the moment the fault broke, all that energy that was stored as elastic strain was released, and that release is what constituted uh, the earthquake. Of course, you know that um, Focus is the name given to the point at depth at which the earthquake starts. And now I realize that I forgot another important uh, concept that I will have to remind you later. And the epicenter is the, the location on the surface of the, of the ground, which is vertically directly on top of the focus. The focus is sometimes also called the hypocenter. All right, um, so that's the way in which earthquakes are generated. And pretty soon we came into the current, uh, um, what is it, contest that we have to have a, a big earthquake or an even bigger or the biggest earthquake possible. And uh, so we needed a way of, of expressing that, that greatness. And somebody came up with the idea that um, if we had um, an instrument that consisted of a heavy mass and that mass was very loosely anchored to a, a container, in this case by a, by a string, then as the earth moved, the container would move, but the mass having a high mass, having a high inertia, would not. And putting a rolling piece of paper under it and a little pen in there would allow the paper to move with respect to the mass which was held solid. 
This is the way in which the original seismographs were done. Now, of course, instead of having a, a string, what we do is we suspend a weight in an electromagnetic field, surround it with a coil and, and magnetize it so that there is no friction whatsoever. But the same principle applies. What moves is the box and not, uh, not the sensor. And with that, you can come up with uh, what you probably have uh, seen many times, a seismograph. And basically, each one of those lines is, I don't know, an hour of time as the, as the drum rotates. And the point that this gal is pointing at is the point of initiation, or the time at which the the um, L waves in this case have arrived. There's all sorts of different waves and, and we'll talk about that uh, at some other time. It's not important for our for our discussion. The point is that this displacement, say from there to here, that maximum displacement that happens when the L waves uh, arrive, gave us a way of measuring the the size of the earthquake and we call that magnitude and you all know that is an independent number is a single number that characterizes an earthquake and is kind of a combination of the energy that was released during the earthquake though in reality it serves very little purpose it serves for you to get all excited and call your parents and and say hey guess what mom and dad we had a 5.8 and then mom and dad will be able to say oh when i was a young woman we had a 7.1 and so she'll trump you but outside of that bragging right there's very little practical use for that measurement. Now, I say that facetiously because scientifically it's important since it is a measure of the energy released by an earthquake. And the one thing that, that um, we have found out is by measuring faults that have broken on the surface, Wells and Coopersmith, these two guys, were the first ones to realize that there was a relationship between the length of rupture uh, of the fault and oh and that's the width that's the wrong that's the the wrong image sorry about that and um, this is a much simplified form there is a relationship between the surface rupture length along the fault 10 kilometers, 100 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers. Clearly here we're, we're dealing with a, um, uh, with a logarithmic scale. And the moment magnitude, uh, which is similar to that scale that you know of. So, for example, during the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, the San Andreas Fault broke over a distance of 430 kilometers. And if you go up here, then you'll see that it was an earthquake of moment magnitude of about 7.8, 7.9. And that if you had a giant earthquake at, say, 1,200 kilometers, as it is suspected that maybe the Chile 1960 earthquake was, then you get a Mongo magnitude of about 8.8. .8. Because the Earth has a maximum uh, circumference of 40,000 kilometers, in theory, the maximum magnitude, if the Earth were to crack all along, would be of magnitude 10. And I'll have to rely on the fact that you know that this is also a logarithmic scale. So the difference between uh, magnitude 5 and the magnitude 6 earthquakes is about a factor of 30 for reasons that have to do with the formula we used to, to calculate this. Um, I'm going to have to correct this slide for future use, but we'll, we'll keep trudging along. Now, in reality, what we discovered, and you, if you have seen photographs of the San Francisco earthquake, we realized that the damage in, caused by an earthquake, the real reason why um, society is concerned about earthquakes is because you're in earthquakes you have all sorts of other effects you have buildings that come down you have fire and that has led to the development of a different type of scale what is called the intensity scale the intensity scale is a location based measure of the damage done by an earthquake and so you need 
a specific location and someone has to describe the damage that happened during that earthquake and you have kind of a, of a checklist sheet in which uh, you report the damage and then based on that damage um, a certain magnitude is is assigned. Um, the problem with this measurement is that it is location dependent so the same earthquake can have different intensities cause different damage depending on where the observer is located. Now for example this com this graph compiles the um, the damage caused by the 1906 earthquake with red being magnitude 7 or 6 uh, green being magnitude 4 and then 2 and 1 here in purple and gray and basically magnitude 4 everybody got scared but nothing else has happened magnitude 1 only very sensitive people uh, get to feel the earthquake and magnitude 7 you have serious destruction Notice that the, the intensity of the 1906 earthquake is relatively limited and that is due to the fact that we have all sorts of faults in California and each one of those faults acts as a reflector, as a mirror that bounces the energy back. So in California our earthquakes are strictly a California affair whereas back east, this happens to be on the right, the the distribution of intensities of the I think 1810 New Madrid earthquake and you see that the zone of destruction the the six covers what a third of the United States notice that there are no observations west of the Mississippi because in 1810 there was nobody west of the Mississippi to to report this this type of earthquake is is so bad because it's basically running uh, or the cities the the population lives on top of either glacial deposits or the deposits of the Mississippi River and there's nothing to interrupt the expansion of the waves in this relatively loose materials to this date the worst seismic danger or scenario that we can imagine in is in, in in the Midwest, which half, which is where half the population of the United States lives, and it's not a matter of if; it's just a matter of when there will be a repeat of the New Madrid earthquake. Um, so, unfortunately, the well, the one thing we understand is that it is horizontal ground acceleration that causes the forces that makes um, buildings topple over. It is great to rely on, on people telling you how bad it was in the little town where they live, but we wish we could replace that intensity scale with a numerical scale that we could collect automatically, and fortunately there is, because of this relation of force to horizontal ground acceleration, it is possible for us to, to place accelerometers in bridges or in buildings or in in the middle of nowhere if need be to collect the data as to the horizontal acceleration that was experienced in the ground because of an earthquake. Now what can we do with that? Uh, well first of all we can collect an acceleration record and I think I mentioned to you this the other day in this type of acceleration records you have in the vertical axis acceleration as a fraction of g and then on the y axis in the x axis sorry you have time and these wiggles that you see are actually the changes in the acceleration of the ground and there is always one that is bigger than the other that is called a peak ground acceleration which in this particular record is 1.5 g and then uh, as i mentioned some a lot of people say well that's the biggest we really want to to design to the horizontal acceleration that is going to be repeated over time and that is the repeated horizontal ground acceleration which happens to be about two-thirds of the peak ground acceleration or in this case 0 0.98 g now 
what can we do with that? Well, if you know where your faults are, and in the case of California, we know where our faults are. This is a map that comes from the Bay Area Association of Governments, or Association of Bay Area Governments, ABGA, or ABA, something like that, um, ABAG. And here you have the different faults, and this is the San Andreas, the northern stretch of the San Andreas, this is the middle stretch, this is the southern stretch, this is the Nacimiento Fault, um, this is the Hayward Fault with two, three segments, four segments, this is the Calaveras Fault with one, two, three segments, and so on and so forth. Now, on all those faults, we know the length of the segment. It has been determined by geology, so we can go to that graph, the one that that correlates length of the fault with uh, magnitude. And so we can say, well, the Hayward Fault has uh, a length of, I don't know, 50 miles or 75 kilometers. If one of the segment breaks, so going to that to that graph we can say okay that's a maximum magnitude of 6.0 for example and then we have a whole bunch of measurements that have measured the distance in kilometers again a uh, uh, logarithmic scale versus the peak horizontal acceleration as a fraction of g and you can see that there's rock sites and there is a general drop in the maximum horizontal acceleration as you move away from the fault and then you have a deep soil substrate and again there's a general drop in the in the peak ground acceleration and I should say that all these quakes have been limited to those with magnitude 5.3 to 5.5 so that we can compare apples and oranges and then you can plot this in Excel in a logarithmic Excel scale and ask Excel to produce a regression line and that's what those the solid line is for rock substrate and the dashed line is for uh, deep soil or, or thick soil and from there on you can say well if I am 10 kilometers from the Hayward Fault and if a 5.5 earthquake uh, happens then I can go here 10 and I go up to my correlation lines and I can say well the maximum acceleration that you're likely to get is 0.12 g. Now I have to warn you the use of this regression curves is that that's kind of the average where the line is. That means 50% of the time the acceleration is lower than that but 50% of the time is higher than that. So I actually like to know what the 50% a regression line is and then maybe the 84 percent the two standard deviation line is because that encompasses a much larger number of, of events. You also have to be aware that the difference between a hard rock site and a soft soil site is that or thick soil site in a hard rock site normally you have very little amplification and uh, the the decrease is relatively fast whereas when you have thick soil sites you have the tendency to have some amplification it's a little bit like like carrying a, oh, a cake and a bowl of jello when you place a cake on the table it may jiggle a little bit but not too much however when you place the bowl of jello on the table it jiggles heavily because of its soft uh, elastic nature and so this is something that has to be taken into account when doing this analysis anyway uh, when you do that and say for example this is the Hayward fault this is the scenario of what would be the peak ground acceleration if the Hayward fault were to break and you can see that all around the Hayward fault you would have extremely high accelerations and probably total destruction and you may also have that event uh, reflecting here in the north side of San Pablo Bay because of the amplification of the waves as they move through the through the bay itself. In contrast, here is uh, the case of the Greenville Fault. In the Greenville Fault, which is farther to the right, you would have that same heavy 
heavy horizontal acceleration immediately around the fault and you would have that effect reflected also here in the in the north part of Susan Bay and Fairfield and those places. So these are kind of, of scenarios and they are labeled you know each one of them has its binder so the police departments have those scenarios and say you are the um, the chief of the police uh, in Hayward. Well, you know that if the Hayward fault is the event, then you are going to be incapable of responding to the event. You know, the police headquarters will fall down, the the streets will be broken, and it's going to be a mess. So, the Hayward folks have made a deal with the Livermore folks that said, okay, if we get hit with this scenario, then Livermore is going to take uh, the lead. And they are going to be the ones that are going to be make sure that there's enough emergency supplies, enough rescue personnel moved into the devastated area uh, to respond to the problem. And in, in exchange, if it is the Greenville fault, then the Livermore police is not going to be, or paramedics or hospitals, whatever you, you think on emergency response, the firefighters are not going to be able to respond. So if that is the scenario, then the Hayward PD and the Hayward hospitals and the Hayward firefighters take over and are the ones that are in charge of controlling the, the damage. Uh, so it's a very useful concept and in fact that is the type of information that is required from geologists. We need to tell that to those people making the measurements or, or calculating the distance so that they can calculate for a whole bunch of points this particular scenario. Um, and this is the seismic zone map of the United States. Um, so you notice here, you can barely read them, but California has a designation of four, which is a high risk uh, zone. In the north part of the state, you have, or outside of the San Andreas Fault, the Central Valley, we have a designation of three. And uh, somewhere there in Colorado, they have a designation of one. Nothing ever happens there. And then by the time you come back into the into the Midwest, you get another high, a three and a two. This is the uniform building code that is used in the United States. And basically, once you have your designation, you can, you find out what your soil profile is. Let me expand that. And there it's basically hard rock, rock, very dense soil, stiff soil profile. And then you use uh, the, the soil, actually, Normally what you would do is first you figure out what the shear wave velocity is and that determines what the the rock is. Then you designate it as one of these types and that goes into the formulas that civil engineers use in order to calculate uh, the horizontal accelerations that a building might be designed for. Um, to measure shear wave velocity, I mentioned that the other day, the best way is to do seismic refraction in which all those little red things are geophones and the guy hits the geophones. So here are the, the geophones and there's the source plate and you have the guy with a big hammer crack and the seismograph or oscilloscope records the arrival of those waves. Now because you planted the, the geophones you have actually good control on the distance between them and then the oscilloscope gives you the different times at which arrivals took place. So you can put that in a, in, in a graph, distance versus time. And I told you the other day, the inverse of that graph gives you the velocity of the wave. And the intersection of those two lines gives you the depth and I told you I was going to tell you the formula. Well, that's the formula. The crossover distance, which is like 12 over 2, times the square root of V2, the, the velocity in the lower layer, minus V1, the velocity in the upper layer, divided by the velocity in the lower layer, plus the velocity in the, uh, in the upper layer. And that's something that we will go over in geophysics. Um, 
Another way is also to use seismic. This is in Las Vegas, so what they did is they went and got a lot of cups of those where you carry your dollars, fill them with sand and put the geophone inside. And basically in this system what you do is you measure surface waves generated by traffic and once you invert that data you can come up with a shear wave velocity profile. Um, so for example you see here that at a depth of 60 to 130 feet you have a nice soil with a high seismic velocity of 6,000 but from 132 to 20 you have a soil that has a lower velocity. Now this velocity and in, this in information, the velocity of P waves, of the compressional waves, is, relate, is equal to the square root of the compressibility module plus four-thirds of the rigidity module, that's the shear modulus, divided by the bulk density of the soil and the velocity of seismic of shear waves is equal to the square root of the rigidity module over the density. So knowing the velocity we can calculate the, the elastic moduli of the soil and that also goes to the civil engineer to incorporate into his, his plan on how to build this building. Um, one effect that is very important that we are going to have to revisit once I'm in front of you is liquefaction. This is a photograph of the effects of the Niigata 1964 earthquake and notice how these buildings just kind of sank. They rotated, they tilted back and, and they are perfectly good. I mean they didn't crack or anything like that. What happened is that the soil failed and this is very common when you have a water saturated sediments. See if you have dry sediments and there's some shaking well the things just rearrange themselves a little bit there's a little bit of settlement but if you have saturated sediments the that force that is applied to them causes high pore pressures and that pushes the grains apart and the moment that happens the soil loses its shear strength behaves like a liquid and that's why it's called liquefaction and all sorts of, of bad things can happen. Here is that uh, concept applied to the Bay Area and in red and yellow you have the zones that are at high risk of liquefaction because the water table is very shallow, the soils are very sandy or the, the soils have a low density, they're not really compacted. And so you can see that all along the shores of the of San Francisco you have a high potential for liquefaction and the same is true along the north side of San Pablo Bay and all along the north uh, edge of Susun Marsh. Uh, by the time you get into the Moctezuma Hills you're in nice hard rock so that is not likely to happen. Um, in Stanislaus we have our very own little uh, piece of heaven. This is a geologic map of the area and uh, in this area in particular but also a little bit here toward Merced uh, we had a series of sand dunes that formed in the not so distant future so most of the soils underneath this part in Manteca where uh, Mayra lives are very thick accumulations of wind-blown loosely consolidated sand and uh, the water surface is close or the, the elevation of the water table is very close to the surface because you're getting very close to the estuary plus you're very close to the big faults of the of the coast ranges. The danger is less down here near Balico well first of all there's nothing in Balico and uh, the the depth of the water table is greater and we're far away from the fault and remember our very own faults protect us against uh, the seismic deformation. Um, now for us the question is uh, for building officials in this case that's what I prepared this presentation for but for geologists as well is how are we gonna make sure that society doesn't do something silly like happened in in Daly City where a whole city went right on top of the San Andreas Fault. That's where you and I come in. 
we need to be able to identify the landforms of active faults and one of the exercises you have to do while I'm away is go to Google Earth and follow the Hayward Fault and, and learn to identify the geomorphology of an active fault. Um, first hint, a linear valley. A linear valley is always a potential source of uh, a fault or maybe indicative of, a, of a, a fault. Streams that change at right angles also, like for example this stream here that goes here and then down here, that's a very good indication that there's a strike slip fault. And remember that in order to tell which way the fault moved you go, imagine you're going up the channel and you come here and say, oh my god, a fault! And you look to the left and you look to the right and you find out that you would have to go to your right in order to find uh, the channel. And it works down the other way as well. If you're coming down here, you can come here and you say, oh my god, a fault! And you would have to turn to your right to come here and continue down the, the creek. So this is a right lateral fault. Uh, springs or little linear ponds that are against a linear edge of a valley, good indicators that there is that there is a fault. Sometimes you can see little scarps or little benches like step stairs. Um, those are always good uh, good indicators. Uh, sometimes, and you're going to see particularly in in the Hayward Fault, there's a long ridge, kind of a sliver that forms parallel to the fault and that's because as the fault moves in the shear zone some of the rock is pushed up and uh, and these ridges sometimes are called shutter ridges because they shut off the the creeks and that's a very good indicator um, this is one of my favorite exam questions so make sure that you that you study this figure carefully now, in California, we have all sorts of faults. We have a lot of strike-slip faults, so this is numero uno on the figures you want to, to put attention to. We also have a whole bunch of uh, reverse faults, and sometimes they are because of, of tectonics, you know, things are pushed together, but in other cases they form because isostasy has lifted a block with respect to the other. This is, for example, the case of the coast ranges. If you want to look for an example of a thrust fault, the front of the coast ranges, the front that gives looks to us, is a big thrust fault. And here is some of the of the features. You may have a hanging wall that is ready to collapse, or you may have um, uh, um, the collapse end of that thrust. Sometimes there is kind of a little anticline that forms as the fault drags itself over the surrounding ground. Sometimes it is accompanied by landsliding. The whole thing sloughs off. And pressure ridges are quite common. As the, as the thing is pushing in, it's kind of stacking in slivers and deforming them as it moves and um, so here's another another nice uh, low angle pressure ridge and um, in the case of of strike slip faults sometimes also toward the ends you get into this wrinkles on the top of the fault they're called an echelon pressure ridges so this is another very important concept that you need to to have in mind. And then finally, normal faults. Normal faults are distinguished because on one side you have one block up and one block down. But if it is in a rock that is brittle, like limestone, normally you're not going to see much of the fault exposed. You know, there's a little bit in here. But you're going to have a lot of rubble coming in, forming scree cones. Um, you know, hold on, let me go back a little bit. The type that we have in the coast ranges is probably a combination of this case here. So what you see as you're driving up toward the, toward Highway 5, Highway 5 runs like here, that 
climb is on some of this material that has been deformed, but a lot of it has actually sloughed off. It's forming kind of a big alluvial fan at the at the foot of the of the coast ranges. Now, if you have a harder rock, say a schist, you will normally find flat irons. You're basically seeing the 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 scarp of the fault, and uh, there is not a heck of a lot of material. This material is hard, so it has the the chance of of cutting its normal streams up uh, up the slope. And then when the fault hits loose materials neogene materials, uh, very frequently you're going to have that instead of having a nice uh, scarp, you're going to have alluvial fans and landslides covering the material. And then a very typical landscape, badlands landscape, in which the streams are deeply incised, that shows to you that that block has been lifted up and the streams are, are working at, at lowering it. Um, three very important concepts. I know for a fact that these are the type of questions they will ask you in the PG exam. So I'll have to give you a copy of this of this uh, presentation. And then uh, you need to start looking for examples of this type of morphology using Google Earth and aerial photographs. Okay, and then the important thing is once you're going to come up here and people are going to say, well, is this slope is this an active fault or not? You can run some geophysics to see the plane of the fault, but ultimately a trench has to be excavated. And I'm going to go up quite a bit. These sack ponds are the best places to, to trench, particularly because you're in the pluvial period, they form long big lakes where a lot of sediment was accumulated. So imagine I'm cutting a, a trench across here and this is the type of detail mapping that you're going to do. Notice that this is this is probably feet, my guess. 13.8. No, it could be meters. 4 meters. Yeah, it's probably meters here. And and then this is probably meters as well. And notice the incredible detail that the the uh, the person doing this uh, has included that's one of the supports of the trench so he kind of ghosted through because he could not actually see but here what you do is you you have a backhoe that excavates the trench and you shore it and then you have to go in and on your knees quite literally map the different horizons and the different breaks between these horizons so for example notice here's a couple of breaks these are old breaks, but they don't cut through the through this red unit. So if you can date that red unit, say that well, that purple is clearly cut. So if you can obtain a, a radiometric date in this purple unit and in this red unit, say this is I don't know fifteen thousand and this is fourteen thousand, then you know that between fifteen and fourteen thousand there was a break. And then you have this fault cuts, 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 all the way to here. It doesn't cut this layer. So again, I would try to date this, maybe this orange layer down here, which is cut, and this gray layer. And the, the difference in the dates is when that fault broke. Now, OK. And this one is not clear that it is breaking. So this branch may or may not have inactive at the time uh, when the gray unit was deposited. Now notice that the, that's the blue unit. Say the green unit here is not cut, but it's cut over here. So clearly this is a younger branch of the fault that has cut through the whole sequence and it has cut the green unit, but not the whatever blue gray unit that is on top of it. That's the way in which we date the breaks of the different faults and uh, and use that to characterize their level of activity. Any fault that is older, uh, more recent than 11,500 years old is considered active. 
and any fault that is younger than 40,000 years old is considered capable. That means it is capable of breaking under the current tectonic conditions because nothing has changed in the last 40,000 years. If it is a critical facility, a nuclear power plant or a hospital, then we push the capable uh, moment to about 100,000 years ago. Just, just to be on the safe side. So what do you do, you do with all that wonderful knowledge? Well, the in 1972, Senator Alquist and, and Speaker or, or Representative Priolum in the state legislature passed what is called the Earthquake Fault Zoning Act. And that Earthquake Fault Zoning Act directed the state geologists to map all known uh, active faults in the state of California represented there in that sketch and to map them very accurately on seven and a half minute uh, maps and then to designate around that a special study zone which is oftentimes a thousand meters some, uh, a thousand feet uh, sometimes it changes but a thousand feet is a good average on both sides of the fault in which a special geologic study is needed. I am going to talk a lot more about that, but this is job security for us because anything that is going to be built inside that hit zone requires the building department to demand or to put as a condition a geologic study before they authorize a construction. In 1990, so what, 18 years later, the Seismic Hazards Mapping Act was enacted saying not only do we want to know where the faults are, the active breaks of the fault, but we also want to know which slopes are susceptible to, to failure during a, an earthquake and, uh, and which slopes are subject to liquefaction. A particular well liquefaction of different types you know? and so those are now being represented in these maps in blue you have areas that are represented in or susceptible to landsliding and in green here here and here are those areas that are susceptible to liquefaction and once again before a building permit is issued uh, those hazards have to be investigated I tell you this because this is what a, a lot of the bread and butter of our profession is up to these days. The the Alquist Priolo Act and, and the different modernization that has been about it very strictly directs cities and counties to adopt zoning laws, ordinance, rules and regulations for implementing the act to post notices of new earthquake fault zone maps and these are normally posted at the local public library as I mentioned and to regulate specified projects within the earthquake fault zones those are the hit zones and mostly it determines the need for geologic reports prior to project development um, building departments because of uh, all history in the United States have very jealously guarded their the right to approve or deny a building permit but this directs those building departments to ask for those special geologic reports uh, including geologic reports that directed at the problem of potential surface faulting for all projects defined by the Act and cities and counties must review these geologic reports for adequacy. So there's another job for a, a good engineering geologist. You have the consultants that are preparing these reports, and then you have the county geologist who has to review this stuff. And all geologic reports must be submitted to the state geologist. So the California Geological Survey, which is headed by the state geologist, is the repository of all these reports. They are not secret, they are not uh, privileged, they are open file. Anybody may consult them and I'll tell you more about that in a later lecture. And just so that you know, our 
closest faults are the Los Baños, or the Ortigalita Fault, really, which crosses the Ortigalita Peak, the Ortigalita Peak Northwest, and the Los Baños Valley. And then there is an extension of that fault on the other side of San Luis Reservoir that appears in the Revision Peak, Crevison Peak, sorry, and Mustang Peak quadrangles. The one thing that is not here is this change in topography that is the Coast Range Thrust Fault. And it is very much active, but we cannot see it, and that's why there is not an alquist priolo uh, map for it. But that's one that we later will see affects a lot of what we, we do. And I think, oh, as far as liquefaction is concerned, one of the problems that we have in liquefaction is if this horizon liquefies and on top of it there's an unsaturated layer that doesn't liquefy, oftentimes if there's an open surface like the San Joaquin River Valley, the San Joaquin River Channel, those blocks will get broken and will raft themselves toward the channel. And so that's another thing to keep in mind when we're looking at projects here near Manteca in this area. And uh, what is it? I don't remember what the names of those towns are. You need to be aware of this possibility that during liquefaction, some of the ground uh, will fissure. We'll talk about ground fissures as a separate issue later. Okay, so I think now you know a lot about earthquakes and faults. You probably want to hear this lecture again. Um, and I will give you a copy of that uh, PowerPoint as soon as I fix it, okay? All right, uh, don't forget that I also want you to look at the San Andreas Fault um, website and take a flight in Google Earth along the Hayward Fault. All right. Good enough. Bye.